Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me for the very first episode of The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. Tonight's program will be filled with stories from all across the U.S. Stories that have been shared with me to be shared with you. From the supernatural to the unexplained, we explore them all here on The Darkest Hour. Growing up, I had the pleasure of spending a few Thanksgivings and other holidays in the small surrounding areas of Yosemite National Park. Some extended family of mine owned a cabin quaintly tucked away in deep, vast amounts of forest. There was no cable, no cell service, a house phone for emergencies, but yes, basically off the grid with the exception of heating and running water. Anyways, the lack of cable or internet was welcomed and made for some really fun game nights. Time to eat way too much food and just kick back with nature. Though the cabin was lovely and didn't harvest any negative energy, the surrounding areas were especially creepy in the night. Total darkness, total silence, except for the moonlight. Still, I enjoyed going for night walks, especially in the snow. I could be alone, listen to my iPod, and since I was very much a 17-year-old trying to smoke a cigarette without getting in trouble, night walks were perfect. Thanksgiving 2009, I was enjoying one of these night walks. Sticking to the more lit-up roadway versus the wooded path, the roadway being a slightly longer path, but the wooded being now completely dark. Both paths led to the same area. It was an area attached to the property where my cousin's grandfather had built one of those wooden swing sets with a slide, a heavy duty one. I love that thing because it wasn't one of those cheap ones made only for small kids. It sat in the middle of an open field with a single large cedar tree with a tire swing. Earlier that day, I helped my younger cousins build an igloo which was in between the two structures, facing the tire swing, the wooded paths, and more deep woods. I decided that it may be a bit disrespectful to smoke completely inside the igloo, so I just laid on my stomach with my head poking out of the igloo entrance. I remember thinking how quiet it was, really serene, the snow, new layers untouched by anything, offering a perfect glow in the dark night. As I went to change the song on my iPod, something caught my eye from the entry of the wooded path I'd opted not to take on my way in. It was in the distance. They were in the distance. I tried to adjust my eyes and see what exactly I was looking at. I saw what had to be a shadow, but what was making the shadow? Still unsure of what I was seeing, I wiggled out of the igloo a bit and focused. It almost looked like a white sheet with sticks for legs. No visible head or eyes and no arms that I could see. Just two legs or sticks, or I don't know. There were two of them, one larger than the other, but identical in shape, blending in almost perfectly with the snow, all but their shadow. I remember I wasn't afraid of them. I even thought maybe they were a mother and child of some kind. But I was so unsure of what I was seeing that I couldn't bring myself to move closer to those things. As I watched, they just kept moving along their way, across the field, seemingly unaware of my presence, 
until they disappeared into the woods just on the other side. Over the years, my curiosity has gotten the better of me. And thanks to the internet, my description, two entities looking like white sheets with sticks for legs, I found claims of the same sightings in California at Yosemite National Park just a year after my experience in 2010. I'm pretty sure what I saw that night was a night crawler. I don't know much about them, and I don't know if anybody else does either, whether they're good or bad. I just know that I wasn't afraid of it, but I had never seen anything like it. And I don't know if I'd want to see it again. My brother died of a drug overdose a couple of weeks ago. We were never close. We had the same dad, but different moms. We used to kick it when we were young, but I moved to a different area code and we eventually lost contact over the years. The night before I heard the news, I had a dream about him. I thought it was odd because in my dream, he didn't say anything. He just sat at the end of my bed with his arm resting on my leg. I remember turning and saying, whoa, man, what are you doing here? It didn't scare me seeing him there. It was almost like a warm reuniting. He leaned over and we hugged. I could feel how tight his embrace was. And I felt his weight leave my arms when he stood up, walked to my door, opened it, and disappeared into the darkness of my hallway. When I woke up the next morning, I noticed my bedroom door was open. I didn't pay much attention to it, assuming it hadn't fully latched when I'd swung it behind me on my way to bed the previous night. It wasn't until I received the phone call saying he'd passed that I remembered my dream, and it's been on my mind ever since. If that was you coming to visit me, it was really nice to see you again. Be well, brother. You're welcome to stop by anytime. This was years ago, early 90s. My boyfriend was driving me home and we saw a man on the sidewalk in the strangest contorted position, kneeling, but with his head toward the ground and neck bent at a sharp angle so that he faced the street. It was two in the morning and the man was covered in sweat. His eyes were wide open. We pulled over and I hopped out of the car to check on the guy. As I approached, I could see that his eyes were wide open, but, well, his face wasn't moving. It really felt like he was pleading for help, though. Sir, are you okay? Do you need some help? He didn't respond. I turned around to face my boyfriend, who was now standing by my side. We looked at the guy, and when we reached out to touch him, he was ice cold. I was sure that he wasn't breathing. This was before cell phones, so we hopped back in the car and sped to my house to call 911. Ten minutes later, the police called back to ask for the cross street again. Apparently, they arrived at the corner, and there was nothing and no one there. I verified that they had the right spot, and they said they would call back if they needed any more information. That was the last I ever heard about it. We checked the newspaper for the next few weeks, but we never found out anything else about the man. In my early 30s, I inherited a piece of property from an uncle who passed away. 
My family enjoyed giving me a hard time about the place, joking that the place was probably haunted or overrun by a community of murderous misfits who had found their way onto this abandoned plot of land, waiting for someone just like me to show up. Well, either way, I decided that I did want to go check out the property, possibly fix it up and sell it. Seemed like a good investment and something that someone in their early 30s should be thinking about. As the weekend approached, I decided now was as good a time as ever, and half-hesitantly decided to go on my own. I didn't really need that false sense of comfort that having someone with you would bring. I was an experienced camper and a nature enthusiast, a fully loaded camper van, and I didn't need running water. I was only going to be there for a night. So I made the drive, which ended up being a little bit longer than I anticipated. As I drove up the driveway, it was curiously darker than the rest of the roads and stretched for quite a while. I realized that four acres was a lot larger than I had thought. The trees were so thick, I imagined myself getting lost. Suddenly I felt chills going down my spine I couldn't put my finger on why that happened, so I ignored it and continued to drive. Then I saw the cabin, which seemed too new for the shabbier surroundings. There were a couple of abandoned cars and a disorganized pile of rotting wood near the shed which was next to the cabin. Maybe it was nerves, but as I got out of the car... I saw a shadow dash across the tree line that I had just driven past, near the middle of the driveway. I stood there a moment, grabbed my pocket knife, and started to open up the van and set up. As I did this, I was trying to look focused on the task at hand while simultaneously scanning all of the tree lines, the cabin, and the surrounding areas, looking for any sort of movement. That's when I saw the shadow. Again, in the distance, same tree line but different position. Just as I tried to focus on the figure, it seemed to disappear into the darker edges of the woods. Might have been a bear, I thought. But I just felt the overwhelming urge to go inside the cabin, possibly stay in there for the night. Especially if I was going to scare myself with shadows all night. Inside, there was no furniture apart from an old table and a single chair. There were several paint cans and a lot of newspapers spread amongst the cabin. It became obvious that my uncle had started remodeling, but his death intervened. Thinking of him, I briefly worried that his ghost might be haunting the cabin. Somehow I shook that feeling, though I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was somehow in the surrounding area I still found myself dragging in my bags and the air mattress. I was not going to hit the road again before getting some sleep or at least checking out the place in full daylight. Besides, I have a pretty active imagination. But just as I settled in and began making notes about what I needed to do to get the place ready to sell, I was interrupted. A metallic noise not far from the back door. I couldn't be sure, but it sounded like metal scraping, but not against something like a tree branch on tin, more like a man-made sound, like sharpening metal. Again, with that active imagination, but the sound was very real to me. Real enough that I got up from the table and I crept over to the back window. When I looked out the window, there was nothing to see. Then, just as I moved to go back to the table, something caught my attention. I literally gasped out loud, covering my own mouth instantly for fear that whatever I saw could hear me. I stood there, frozen, staring at what looked like a large silhouette, staring at me from the edge of the woods. It wasn't moving and didn't seem to disappear or be bothered that I was aware of its presence. 
Too thin and small to be a bear, I thought to myself. But why would there be a person out in the middle of nowhere? And why are its eyes glowing? Changing my position, I moved closer to the kitchen window, where I switched off the light to potentially get a better idea of what I was looking at without being seen. But it was gone. Deciding not to be brave, I stayed in the cabin, continuing to journal. I started to think about the shadow again and the glowing. Maybe it was glow bugs, I thought. Reflectors on the trees. But why did they disappear? Before I could even finish my thought, I heard the metallic noise again. This time, it sounded like it came from inside the cabin. I got up, quietly moved around to find my pocket knife, but as I did, through the cabin window, the shadow appeared again. This time, it looked closer to the cabin, still on the edge of the woods, but larger. I didn't move trying my best to see if it was real. It was definitely there. Not glow bugs or reflectors. Eyes. It seemed like hours went past, but eventually I had to blink. When I did, it disappeared. I decided that I had to leave because if what I was looking at was an animal, I didn't like the idea of it getting closer. I gathered up my things and walked quickly towards the front door, deciding to just leave the air mattress behind, keys in hand. Before opening the door, I started to panic. If this was a person, they could be waiting for me to make this run. As these thoughts raced through my head, they suddenly stopped. It's inside, I thought, as I heard something fall over in the next room. And with that realization, I opened the door and ran as fast as I could to the van, frantically looking for this thing as I made my way down the driveway, looking from rear view to tree lines back to rear view. I could see the figure. I could see the glowing eyes. But this time, it was inside the cabin. Staring at me through the same window I had spotted it from earlier, I slowed down a bit for one last look before the cabin would become completely out of sight. It didn't disappear. Instead, I saw it move. It looked as though it had been raising its arm to wave. Now I was out of sight, wondering what the hell I had just seen. After that, I ended up giving the property away to my dad. He isn't easily scared and claims he has had no issues with visitors. You are listening to The Darkest Hour. Our broadcast will continue after this message. I wanted to take a moment to talk about something my husband Ryan and I in our band Forget Me Not are doing this summer. We're teaming up with the Foundation for Edmond School District and their Nourishing Network program to support students and families in need. This morning, we kickstarted our campaign by releasing our latest single, Sweetest Thing. All summer long, we'll be donating 100% of music-generated proceeds to the Foundation. You can help just by listening to our music. So. For all the details, be sure to follow us and visit our website, conducted by forgetmenot.com. If you wish to donate or get involved with the foundation, please visit foundationesd.org. Help make no student hungry a reality.
When I was a teenager, I used to babysit my cousin Alyssa. She was little, maybe almost two. Old enough to say sentences, but that's about it. I'm giving her a bath one night before bed when she looks out into the hallway and gets a terrified look on her face and starts crying. At this moment, my aunt's Pomeranian starts going nuts, barking, growling, also in the hallway. The atmosphere in the room became extremely uncomfortable and I started getting scared. I took her downstairs from the third floor in the townhome to try to calm her down. I asked her what was wrong and she said something along the lines of, the man with the black eyes was there. When I continued to pry, she looked up at the second floor stairs, her eyes getting big, looks at me, bringing her finger to her mouth and said, shh, while shaking her head no. Do you have childhood memories that you grew up thinking were totally normal, but when you became an adult and looked back at them, you thought, wait a second, something wasn't right there. A couple of days ago, my husband and I were walking through town where we saw an old beat up ventriloquist dummy in the window of the antique shop. It looked like a classic dating back to the vaudeville days. I knew this because my grandfather used to own one that looked just like it, named Benny. It was handed down from my great-grandfather, who was apparently a pretty talented performer on the vaudeville scene. Before he died, he passed on the art of ventriloquism, along with this creepy-ass doll, to my grandfather. I was a dumb kid, so I thought it was magic when my grandpa would bring Benny out and he would come to life. When I was about four or five, I remember my grandpa used to sit me on his lap with Benny. And they would tell me jokes, and we would all laugh until my stomach hurt. He could even sing a little bit. Man, I loved that creepy doll. Now, as my husband and I stood in front of that window, looking at the old ventriloquist doll, it was nice to recall such positive thoughts of childhood fun with grandpa. But then... Those thoughts were interrupted by a vivid memory. Me, sneaking into my grandpa's closet when he would mow the lawn so I could play with Benny. I remember Benny being able to talk and sing just as he'd done before. I didn't think anything of it as a kid. I just thought, that's what Benny does. I still don't really know how to feel about this. I grew up in a small town in the southern point of Oregon. In the summer of 2006, I was playing PlayStation with my friend David in his basement. It was about 2 a.m. when his older brother Nick came into the room with three cartons of eggs. Nick said that he was meeting a friend, Jordan, at the golf course to egg the houses that lined it. David was visibly apprehensive about the idea but I was collecting my coat as soon as Nick suggested it. After some convincing, David got his shoes on and we all started walking to meet up with Jordan. It took about 20 minutes to walk to our destination. Once we arrived, Jordan met us, also carrying several cartons of eggs. We decided to go through the old golf course, as the houses near the ninth hole have the biggest windows making the best targets. There was also lots of trees that we could duck behind, dodging flashlights or people that were trying to catch the assholes egging their property. We covered those houses. Over five dozen eggs, gone. We felt like rebels right there, 
and even made it into the local paper. Vandals egg neighborhood over weekend. But that's not the reason I hold such a vivid memory of that night. As we begin to head through the empty golf course back to our respective locations, I see something in my peripherals. As I glance over, I see a very tall, old woman standing 20 yards away, staring at us. She wore a long black dress and looked to be out of this era. Some sort of thin, sheer shawl draped over her head. I let out a scream, and before my brain had time to fully process what I was seeing, I had already started running as fast as I could. What scared me more is that the exact same moment that I screamed and took off, so did Nick, meaning we both saw the same thing or saw something, someone standing there. With most ghost encounters, one can usually rule out the sightings as their eyes playing tricks on them or the light. But when two people see the exact same entity at the exact same time, it becomes harder to ignore. I remember having the worst time sleeping that night. It's hard to explain, but when I saw the woman, I had this terrible feeling, and I think that's why I ran or screamed. Anyways, it wouldn't seem to go away, even when I got home. I must have fallen asleep, but most of my dreams were filled with that same feeling. There was no woman, but a dark place, emptiness. I felt trapped. Just when I thought the feeling was for sure permanent, that I was stuck in this empty space forever, I woke up. Everything felt normal. No empty feeling, no darkness, just normal. When I talked to my friends later that day, neither David or Jordan admitted to seeing anything that night. But Nick and I know there was someone or something out there. And we both agreed that was the last time that we were going to egg anyone's house or mess with people's property. Karma is real. This is not my story, but my aunt's, who's an oncology nurse. During one of her night shifts, she was floated to hospice, where she was responsible for a patient who was passing away and had been unconscious for several days. At one point, my aunt thought she heard something coming from the patient's room. She knew it was way too late for visitors and that no nurses were in this area of the hospice wing. She went to check that everything was okay, and when she entered the doorway of the room, she saw the previously comatose patient now sitting at the edge of her bed. She looked at her and said, Don't let them take me. My aunt was freaked out, but walked over and calmly asked her who was going to take her. The woman pointed into the air and said, The black thing up there. Just as my aunt turned to look, the woman grabbed her right hand, laid back onto her bed, and closed her eyes. She had a pulse, but was non-responsive. My aunt sat with her, holding her hand, trying not to look up. The patient died a few minutes later. My aunt has lots of stories, but this one always stuck with me. Thanks for letting me share. I should have recorded these events earlier in life, but I'll do my best to recount them here. In the late 1980s, my parents' business was doing well, and we were able to move into a nice, quiet, suburban area in Sacramento, California. I was about eight or nine at the time, and my parents had just had their second child, my sister Allie. The neighborhood was nice, 
and the house was beautiful. But the best part about the move was the swimming pool in the backyard. Being a kid, you can imagine how very excited I was to have my own pool to swim in. The first few months in the house were great. Everything seemed normal. Until it wasn't. The first event was one day after school. Usually I would get home a couple of hours before everyone else and I had a routine. Doing whatever I wanted, watching whatever I wanted, eating whatever I wanted. I actually really enjoyed it. So I made myself a sandwich and headed to the living room to watch TV. All of a sudden, I heard a loud splash come from the pool. I put my sandwich down, walked over to the back door, and opened the slider. When I looked at the pool, I expected to see ripples from whatever had hit the water, but it was completely still. I closed the door, deciding that the splash must have come from somewhere else. Maybe another house had a pool and I just didn't know them yet. The next day, I came home from school and was watching TV. I started to hear footsteps coming from outside. The footsteps sounded wet, like someone was walking with water in their shoes. But my parents weren't due home for another hour. I ran, peeked out the window of the front room. No cars in the driveway. The footsteps hadn't stopped. They were actually closer. They were inside. More afraid than I'd ever been, I slowly crept down and crawled across the hall to my room, where I quietly closed the door. I curled up near my bed on the floor, hoping to be out of sight. I could still hear the footsteps, but this time it was more like splashes on carpet. They were getting closer to my room. From under the door, I could see what looked like feet stop in front of my room. And I could hear water dripping onto the carpet. I closed my eyes, not making a sound, trying to be as small as possible. The dripping sound went on for what felt like forever. But I refused to open my eyes. Finally, the dripping stopped. Splash. The pool, I thought. Then, nothing. I opened my eyes, and everything was normal. Quiet, no footsteps, nothing. I walked to my door, opened it slowly, preparing to see a puddle of water. But when I looked down, the carpet was dry. I hurried back to look at the pool, only to find that it was motionless again. I didn't tell anybody about the footsteps, although looking back, I probably should have. The following weekend, my family had a barbecue. My aunt and uncle came over with my cousins, and my dad had set up a table near the pool so we could all eat outside. I remember playing with my cousins near the pool. We were called over to eat, and we all started heading to the table. Then, I don't know how it happened, but what I can tell you is that something was drawing me near the pool and away from the table. There were no voices, just a force pushing me to the edge of the water. Suddenly, before I could even grasp what was going on, I was submerged in water, and I couldn't breathe. I was unable to move, like there was an invisible force keeping me pinned down. I was pinned down to the floor of the pool. I knew how to swim, so why couldn't I move? I couldn't breathe. Just as I thought I was going to be taking my last breaths, my uncle jumps in to save me. It felt like he was having to wrestle with something to get me to the top. Later, he told me that when he grabbed me, he felt something pull back, 
like I was being held down somehow. Thinking I may have been stuck on something, he went back to see what was in the pool. Nothing. Sadly, after that day, I never used the pool again. And lucky for me, probably my sister too, we moved a little less than a year later. My parents kept telling me that this was an accident, that I had merely slipped. But I knew it was something more than that. Some sort of force guided me into that pool. And I knew that whatever had tried to drown me may have succeeded if given another chance. I'm a nurse and this happened at my old job when I worked the night shift. I was walking down the hallway with my computer on wheels, cow, to pass evening meds. I was in between two patient rooms, but not really close to either door, and was far enough away from the nurse's station and kitchenette. I could faintly hear one of the physical therapists talking to a patient in one of the rooms, saying goodnight, but no one else was in the hallway. I was looking down at my papers to kind of get myself organized before going to see another patient. When all of a sudden in my right ear, as if someone was standing right behind me, I heard a female voice say, I'm cold. In kind of a jokey way, like someone would do a big shiver and rub their arms and say, I'm cold. I jerked around thinking it was my friend Kim messing with me. But no one was there. There was no one in the hallway at all. A couple of years ago, when I was pregnant, my husband and I were living with his brother in his two teens. My husband was working a lot at the time, and my brother-in-law worked offshore about 14 days of the month. So when he wasn't around, his kids stayed with their grandmother. He had an elevated house on quite a bit of former hunting land, several miles down a country road. Nice house, but I always thought it had a weird vibe. I chalked it up to spending so much time alone and pregnancy hormones. One day, home alone, I was taking a shower and felt someone staring at me. I stuck my head out and listened. Couldn't hear anyone in the house, so I resumed showering. A while later, I heard the back door shut. I was standing in the kitchen and could now see the door, which had no steps and was six feet from the ground. The door was still locked. I told my husband about it that night, and he shrugged it off. We locked down and went to bed. I don't know how long I had been asleep, but I woke up to the blankets being yanked off and my husband running around the room, then the hallway, proceeding to flip on every light in the house. He threw open every door, every cabinet, looked in every pantry or closet, all while holding his handgun. I asked what was going on and he swore he heard boots thumping through the house and someone talking. But everything was still locked, and it's not a very big house. Nobody was there except for us. Another night, about a week later, my husband and I picked the kids up from their grandmothers a little early so that they could be home to greet their dad in the morning. That night, a while later, my niece came into our room and asked if she could sleep with us. Now, this girl isn't scared of anything and is 14 at the time. I sat up, told my husband, scoot over, and patted my pillow. That's when I noticed her 16-year-old brother was already curled up under a blanket on the floor beside me. 
Why are you both in our room at two in the morning? They didn't want to answer at first, but explained that something in my niece's room laughs at night. And that tonight, when my niece ran into my nephew's room first, something started knocking on my nephew's door. They came to our room as soon as it stopped. Again, husband flipped on every light, looked in every nook and cranny, nothing. Later, my husband told me that when he went to check, he heard a man laughing in my niece's room, but there was nobody there when he turned on the lights. Scared the shit out of him. I hated that room when we moved in and when I'd put laundry away, I'd do it so quickly. So much for pregnancy hormones. This was a couple of years ago, and for context, I'll start by saying I had a Wii, and the sensor bar was on the TV stand directly in front of the TV, as is anyone else's, I'm sure. I didn't have the cord connected to anything. It was just hanging behind the TV in a jumble. Anyway, I was renting a mother-in-law-style apartment in Seattle from an elderly couple that no longer accessed their downstairs. I had gotten a really sweet deal on the place, and I hadn't had any trouble. One night, I had my girlfriend over, and we were watching TV, cuddling on the couch. And suddenly, the Wii sensor bar literally flies across the room till it got to the end of its length and fell to the floor. Like someone had grabbed it and chucked it across the room. We could find no explanation for this whatsoever. I had my dog at the time, but he was on the couch, sitting right next to us, looking as shocked as we were. I ended up moving in with my girlfriend later that year. Okay, I'm entering a disclaimer here. It was not a mountain lion. I live in the sticks of Michigan, but a decent-sized neighborhood, about 20 houses. Our streets make two circles. I was home with my toddler, who was taking a nap, so I was on my back porch drinking coffee. Around noon, I hear a piercing scream that seems to last at least 30 seconds. I'm startled, so I go to my fence, walk up my driveway, take a look around. There's a man hauling ass down the street, cradling his arm and dripping blood all over the concrete. He sees me and shouts, Did you see that fucking cat? Which way did it go? I saw no animal, but I asked if he needed help. He declined, saying that an ambulance was on its way and he just needed to find the cat thing. Perplexed, I pulled off my long sleeve and handed it to the guy, telling him to at least wrap up his injury. He holds up his arm, and his fingers are mangled. A house cat did this to you? As I gently wrap up his hand. This was not a regular cat. We just, we have to find it. So I help him look. So do a few other neighbors. The ambulance arrives a few houses down at his place, so we walk down and sit on the curb next to it. Suddenly, commotion from the other way and a half a dozen people sprinting to the cul-de-sac to try to corner this thing. It disappears around a house and we hear a volley of barking. Just then, another man comes from behind the house, running at full speed toward the ambulance. I'm sitting with Bloody Guy, and running guy gives him a tissue. 
I almost fainted and probably would have if I were standing. In the tissue was Bloody Guy's thumb and pointer finger. We never caught the cat thing, and I didn't get a good enough look at it to figure out what it was. Bloody Guy said that when he was weeding his garden, a giant black fuzzy thing with teeth and a tail chomped his hand from under a bush, took off running fast. He tried to follow it, but it was way too fast. He said it stood taller than his knees, and he was 6'5". Got all his fingers reconnected properly, though, and has since installed a pretty heavy-duty fence. I went to high school in Ocean Shores, Washington, a charming little tourist town on the coast of the state. My family owned a home that was beachfront, only separated by a short walk through the sand dunes. As a teen, I didn't always take advantage of living somewhere with full beach access, but I did really enjoy walking through the dunes at night, taking in the sky, listening to the waves. I was about 16, and it was a really clear night, so my girlfriend and I decided to take a walk to the beach to watch the stars. As we were quietly tucked away in the dunes, watching the constellations above us, I suddenly feel my girlfriend nudge me and point. As I follow the direction of her index finger, I see the figure of a woman, slowly walking through the sand and toward the ocean. At this time of night, the beach is completely dark. Aside from the illumination of the moon reflecting off the water. Usually, this is a peaceful, serene atmosphere to sit in. But the presence of this figure, her movements toward the water and what looked like nothing more than a nightgown, made the setting feel ominous. The woman didn't seem to notice us as we sat silently watching her in the moon's light. As she neared the water, her steps maintained, unhurried, consistent with the pace she had started. I watched as the figure entered the tide and continued forward. Almost in disbelief of what I was seeing, I looked over at my girlfriend Curious if she was also observing this. Her eyes were wide, fixed on the woman in the water. I turned back to see that her head was almost fully submerged, with only the top of her head above the water. It looked and felt like she was now staring in our direction until she disappeared into the water completely. My girlfriend squeezed my hand. We grabbed our stuff and we ran. When we got back to my house, we felt like crazy people as we tried to piece together what we had just witnessed. We thought about telling our friends or anyone else, but we realized that there would have been too many unanswerable questions. Like, why did we run? Neither of us could really answer that, even to each other. So we decided it would be best to just drop it. That was over 20 years ago. And even today, I still think about the woman in the water. Would you be alive if I wasn't too afraid to help? Were you even alive to begin with? I thought this would be a good place to share my story without fear of judgment that often fills a room when such claims are brought up. And who knows? 
Maybe there's someone out there that's experienced the same thing. I work in Yakima, Washington, but live on the reservation in White Swan. About four weeks ago, I'm driving down Fort Road, and the stations on my radio begin to change. Not like cutting in and out of bad reception, but racing up and down the channels. My truck is a classic, not mint condition or anything. It was handed down from my grandfather, who did his best to keep it beautiful. But if anyone knows a classic, they know how costly maintenance can be, and sometimes it's enough just to keep the engine running. At first, I chalk it up to poor wiring. The dials continue to shoot up and down the frequencies, and I swear I hear a voice. Can you hear me? Through the static. I keep driving and try to turn off the radio to get rid of the static. I realize I'm not able to turn it off. And again, I hear, Can you hear me? As the stations change. It seemed to be getting louder, despite not being able to adjust the volume. At this point, it's just noise, and I'm pretty frustrated. So I sarcastically shout, Yes, I can hear you! To my car's radio. And as I am now laughing to myself, I notice the dial begins to move faster through the frequencies. The shuffling static, clearly and loudly, began to repeat, I see you! I see you! With my frustration now replaced with total fear and anxiety, I floored it. And I mean I have never pushed that old truck to the limits that I did trying to get out of there. Looking in my rear view, I could see nothing but my taillights, glowing dimly in the black. But as I moved to look forward, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a dark mass in my passenger seat. That hadn't been in my perifs earlier in the drive. Going almost 90 down a two-lane highway, I kept my gaze locked on the road. I didn't dare look over to see what was there. Eventually, my headlights hit the gravel of my driveway. I kicked my truck door open and spun around to face this dark mass that had been sitting next to me, only to find that my passenger's door was already open. And now, I was alone. No footsteps running away. I didn't even hear the door unlatch. But that didn't change the fact that my passenger's door was still open. I've since sold the truck, and I do my best not to drive down Fort Road after dusk. Has anyone else ever had an experience with an uninvited hitchhiker? How do you know they've actually left and didn't just follow you inside? Well, everyone, that concludes tonight's episode of The Darkest Hour. But we'll be right here next week same time, same place. If you have stories like these, I would love to hear them. Email me, amandadarkesthour at gmail.com. In closing, please enjoy Forget Me Not's Sweetest Thing. Take care. It's been-
been my way for days Mr. Sandman can skip my place I'm here to stay Cause no need for sleep When you're right next to me But if you, you choose to go I'll be dreaming, dreaming of you And I'm waiting just to feel a connection Feel this connection to you Conducted by forgetmenot.com. Conducted by forgetmenot.com.